Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast about everything deep sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. With me, as ever, is the professor. Hello. It's different again. It is different again. I can see you. We're in the very quiet room. Yeah, but not in a weird voyeur kind of way. You can actually see me because I'm in the same room as you. Yeah, yeah. I do like human yeah. contact. We're not, we're not in any room either. We're not in my wardrobe in Australia. It's not like you came to Australia so you can sit in my wardrobe with me. <laughs> I'd do it. If we soundproof that, it's probably pretty good. You have to take out quite a lot of the women's clothes. Yeah, that's a good sound, Buffalo. Yeah, it does. You know, like, in a wardrobe, it's pretty good. Yeah, we're in the special room again. We're in the very quiet room. There is something though, isn't there? I was oh, playing yeah. with the lights before you got here and it's not the lights. I think it's the air conditioning. There is something else. There's a hum. Uh, as a, we could literally tear this place apart looking for it. <laughs> then find a tiny then, humming cockroach. Then have to explain to the <laughs> lovely people who gave us it why we yeah. just destroyed their soundstage. And apparently the perfectly silent spaces just make people go insane, so maybe this is for the best. Yeah. Ah, quite okay. It's nice and black. It's got foamy walls, so you can you can really go for it, because you just bounce off the walls. Do you have a feeling this is in our future? This is where we'll end up in a padded room at some point. That's what it feels like, isn't it? It's, it's even got the, like, the window for like the police to watch you through <laughs> It needs to be one way. It needs to be mirrored. Yeah, definitely. So the people studying us can make their notes. Yeah, I mean, the point is I'm not in Australia right now. No, you're here. That's a turn up for the books, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So what brings you here? There's a few different... Just you, Tom. Just you. Just, uh, just for this. Yeah. You came all the way just, just for this. Just for this one episode. An hour thought, this is going to be a blinder, this one. <laughs> Get on a plane. Bring all the kids, everybody over to Australia. Yeah, disrupt a whole family. Yeah. No, no, just over for a bit. A few weeks. Running over to New York tomorrow. That's an exciting one. Can you talk about that? I guess so. The big expedition I was involved in Five Deeps are getting a whole couple of awards at the Explorers Club in New York, which is nice, which is a big old prestigious sort of clubby thing. Just go to the website and read about the Explorers Club. Okay, I'll put a link. I'll put a link in the Weirdly, I'm, I don't know, I'm not a member. There you go. It's the Explorers Club. It's a big high profile thing. It's very nice. And it was supposed to be in 2020, but it never happened. And the 2021 never happened either. So then there's a big one. There's 1,500 people going for dinner in some place in the middle of Manhattan. And we all got to wear tuxedos. Nice. So I am wearing a tuxedo with a bow tie. So a couple of days worth of stuff. I think I'm only going to go to the dinner. Uh, but there's uh, possibly there's a award ceremony in the morning and Victor Rick Scovo's getting one for... He's getting some sort of medal and I think Rob McCallum's getting one on behalf of the expedition and so on. And there's a few, quite a few folk from the expedition are turning up. So it's a proper reunion. And Susan Case is coming. Case hey. is going to finish off her book on the whole expedition. Oh, kind of that's the, it with us. That's one the last, last chapter, blast isn't it? In, yeah, one yeah. last blast in New York. Tim McDonald, who's also been on the podcast... We'll be there. Yeah. Patrick Lahey and his lovely wife will be there as well. So yeah, it'll be a good, good time. Plus I get to run around New York. I hear it's boring. Yeah, I hear it's rubbish. I hear it sleeps all the time. Yeah, everyone goes to bed about 8pm. Yeah. Yeah, they get up early. Farmer's hours. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that that's the reason why I'm here. Plus there's a whole bunch of stuff in Newcastle and Bournemouth and Edinburgh and... A tour. Mad headless chicken run around the UK while I've got the chance. There's still stuff going on here. There's still like collaborations and... Oh yeah, yeah, it never stops. It never stops, but it's good to meet everyone in person for the first time in a long time, so that's been kind of good, and uh, nothing's changed. It's still disappointing every time you get off the train. <laughs> but it's a familiar disappointing, it's like, ah, there yeah, you are. Yeah, this is my disappointing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember you, hello darkness, my old friend. A nostalgic disappointing. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, yep, and then I go back, and then I've got another jolly, which I'll tell you about next time. Oh, okay, right, so That's a secret. But we, did we talk really about your last jolly? Because you were still out there, weren't you? You were just oh yeah, to yeah. Go. It's been a busy, it's been a busy couple of months. Uh, yeah, so I just got back from sea. I built three brand new full ocean depth landers, which still have no name, but they worked. So now they they do get a name. Can we can we put it to the listeners? One, one, of, them's, <laughs> one of them's got a kind of an unofficial name, and it's T Sack. And you know, anyone under thirty would probably find that a, a smear of toxic masculinity. And anyone over thirty will think it's really funny and you end up. I'm not going to say why. But the... how did it earn that name? Well, because the guy who built it, his name begins with T, and it's a great big sack that <laughs> is to scoop fish off the bottom. Oh, it's the... So right. it's like a big Santa sack, but rather than feel full of presents, it's full of sort of deep sea smelly presents. But it didn't really work because... Oh. Well, it did work. Actually, mechanically, it worked beautifully. Uh, and it even pursed and everything. But there was never a fish in the right target zone. You just can't... Burr. Yeah. Yeah. They're still difficult, but that... So it's a game of... Uh, I'm really excited for that design. Like, I think... It'll pay We've off. still got to get lucky. It's still catching deep sea fish, which isn't easy. So what we did with three new landers, brand spanking new, never been in the water before, on a brand new ship we've never used before. Uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say what it was. No. Yet. And uh, we went out to Diamantina, Fracture Zone, and as per tradition, 
rather than doing a shallow water test to see if these things actually work. Don't hesitate. Took, the, took number one and just threw it down to the deepest point in the office. Australian mainland. How else do you test a parachute? Exactly. Just threw it out of the plane, <laughs> 6,300 metres, came back, we only left on the bottom for 20 minutes just to check the lighting was good and all the rest of it, brought it back. And I said, okay, that's fine, let's fire them all down. So fired them all down. Bold. And came back with two new species of snailfish. Very nice. And some very nice video. We saw lots of siphonophores. Remember the Fantasia I was talking about, the headless chicken monster called en- Enipneastes? Yep. At uh, 2,000 metres on the north end of the fracture zone on the soft naturalist plateau area i think never seen so many yeah it was all the time there was at one point there's like six in the view of a static camera and they were just lying on the seafloor and roaming around jumping up in front of the camera these are things you don't see very often they're like yeah. bright red transparent holothurians that look like they've got had their head cut off and they've got like a 17th century frill <laughs> and they're mobile they've decided to go there Oh, yeah, yeah. There's you, something you, about that spot. if you watch the video on fast forward you just see them just munching across the bottom and then they just sort of take it off and but weirdly, the other cool thing about that job was I was watching the video back going, I've never seen so many of these things in my life. This is quite bizarre. And then suddenly they all changed direction. Wow. Right? It's like, ooh, that's weird. And there was a guy we, we brought on board because we were totally short-handed. And he he, he really took on this, this current meter data. I was going to ask, was that the current shifting? And you reckon it's a big, no, I reckon it's a cascade event. Oh. Because the whole entire water mass changed for four hours and then changed flipped back again. So if it was tidal, it would be much slower and much more gradual yeah. and it moved from one to the other. But didn't it just kind of went on off. And everything sort of went berserk and then it all went back together again. You get these crazy like flushing events in yeah. in canyons because basically there's different densities to the water and the shape of the seabed means it almost fills a trough of dense water yeah. and then some other anomaly will just cause that to cascade down. It is like flushing a toilet. It is like suddenly that whole basin empties and you'll get like cold or different density water suddenly flood over the bottom and looks like the animals paid attention. Yeah. So here's what we're looking at. So it was good. We did 19 deployments in the end. Between, I think we did three, two, three, four, five, six, and six and a half. And uh, it was a game of two halves. The first half wasn't very good. Lots of bad weather. Lots of bad weather. I think we did eight days. One day's worth of work, which was a phenomenal day. Well, it's the first day. It was like the... But on that first eight days, that was the only day we did. And it was just, there was a cyclone kicking around in the East Indian Ocean, which didn't know what to do with itself. It was doing this little hokey-cokey. <laughs> it's just really interesting. It's just really annoying. It just just wouldn't, it. Yeah, it just wouldn't do one, one thing or another. So hmm. we just got bashed. We ended up running all the way to Dunsborough at some point and then came running back again. And then the second half, it was just bash, 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 bash every day. It was kind of cool. It's a good, solid data set. Everyone keeps lying to me. Everyone says, oh, these cyclones, what they do is they come south and then they come halfway down the coast of WA and then they scream across the continent and they just fizzle out. That's what happens. It's like, is it? Or well, why is it still there? <laughs> oh, no, no. Why is it about, fizzling? I was it's about to fizz- turn left. You wait for it. Yeah, it's, it's going to turn left tomorrow. I said, why is it going back up again? And it's like, and it comes back down again. And then it goes a little bit left, a little bit right, a little bit up, a little bit down. It's like, it's not blown out, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it'll, it'll go in a minute. Why is this one drunk? Yeah, eight days later, <laughs> gone. <laughs> Cyclone off. But yeah, that was the second of six. So we're well ahead of ourselves in terms of dominating the entire West Australian margin. Nice. Mm. Busy, busy. It was That's... nice to see the landers work. It was very cool. I saw with such a relief. And it's amazing footage. It's really, really nice. It's yeah. not just valid data. It's like aesthetically pleasing data. Yeah. Which is... Yeah, satisfying on the day. So. With all that's been going on, do you have a soundtrack in your brain? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> well, I don't know. Gregorian monks screaming. <laughs> yeah, it's just a medieval leper colony chanting something at me. <laughs> no, at the moment, I would say the song of the day is probably Let Them Go by the Wild Hearts. Oh, okay. Mm, I had that on the car on the way down. I've been driving for four hours this morning already. <laughs> it's not quite as dark as your your usual leanings. Yeah, but it's more human than human. White zombie. Had that one. That's a good one. No, I had not heard that in a long time. <laughs> That's a good one, that one. That's a good angry one. At least I think it is. It's hard to tell Rob Zombie because everything he says sounds angry. He might be singing lullabies. It's hard to tell because you can't work out what he's saying anyway. So. <laughs> he's a good director and apparently quite lovely as well. So, yeah, maybe he just sounds like that. Yeah, he just lives in a horror film. <laughs> and likes it. He's a really nice bloke <laughs> trapped in a horror film. <laughs> but he seems to enjoy that. So, Oh, no, we forgot about oh, something wait. else. Well, go, go, go. We went to the pub last week. We did. We did. Yeah, we went to the pub. We got lots of drinks. We did. It was a good sesh, wasn't it? We met in town at 230 and I think I fell through the doorway at about 11.30. Yeah, I don't know. I was in a hotel. But we ate half a Japanese restaurant. We did. A good solid 50% of that whole restaurant. <laughs> well, everyone ordered their food, and then one of our party was just like, oh, and we'll have the, the set menu as well. Yeah, we'll have everything else as well. Whatever he said, plus everything else. Yeah, that was good. That was a good solid. We went to the smallest gin bar in the world. We did. 
We did. And it was small. It was a Which was a, a good corridor. opportunity for me to declare that I don't like gin. Yes, loudly, because everyone in the bar could hear, because yeah. it was so small. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to think of a timing on that one. Excellent. What's this got to do with Deep Sea? I don't know. Getting drunk seems to be part of it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, I can, I can call you bluff. Oh. I've got your wee Easter gift. Oh, I know what that is. Yes. Bluff called. It's a deep sea podcast apron. <laughs> For all your Aussie barbecues. Oh, yeah. Can I put it on now? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And you know what? I had to activate this as an option. So now, now everyone can buy. I've got number one. You've got number one. Now everyone can buy the aprons. Look at that. It's looking good. When you're doing your barbecues, oh, Aussie do, culture. Don't do barbecues in us. What? They don't. They just got these big hot plates in the park. There's no fire. Because if you have a barbecue in Australia, the whole continent suddenly ignites. It was on fire when I was last there. Yeah. Oh, it ignites all the time. So you don't really have barbecues. They're kind no, of fake you barbecues. You don't have open, open don't, flame? No. Hot plates. Wow. Like I'm telling you, everything about Australia is a lie. Except for the deadly animal thing. <laughs> That's only there. Yeah. Next you'll be telling me Foster's isn't over there. No, I haven't seen anyone drink Foster's over there. <laughs> yeah. And no one says rack off. What? I don't know. Oh. Is it maybe because he can't swear on neighbours? <laughs> That's up entirely made up. Very specific word. Because I think if they were speaking as genuine Aussies... They might use the, the yeah. mother tongue. The, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This means I can... Uh, you, know, you know, I've always said how much I like baking cakes. Along this line, I also remember you lying to students about when your birthday was because you wanted a cake. I got it though, didn't I? You did get it. Like, I'm not denying yeah. it. But yeah. But you... the twist of that was, when I finally got the cake, they had found out my real birthday and wrote that on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> so I made it now. You might as well eat it. But just for the record, we know yeah, you're a liar. we do know. Yeah. You still got your cake, though. I, that's got nothing to do with the other. But anyway, thank you very much for my cake baking attire. <laughs> I shall no longer suffer from uh, flower crotch. Ah, oh, good. Carry on. Should we do some recent news? Yes. Our old friend TMAO. Trimethylamine and oxide, a chemical we've talked about before, a chemical we love basically. It lets fish go deep and it makes them smelly. Two of the best things about deep sea fish. But it has another application, or at least someone's found another application, and this gets a little bit chemical engineering y, and it will be rapidly apparent that I only barely follow this. Microtubules are a major part of the cytoskeleton in living organisms. So within the cell, it's not just goo in there, there's like hidden highways that move products sort of to and from in the cell so like everything's like different little factory and then there's these highways that connect things to them and the rigidity of the microtubules affects how they flow through that gel so if they're nice and straight and rigid they move through it very quickly and then if they crumple and bend a little bit that sort of increases their drag and that is how the cell adjusts their speed through cytoplasm. When we try and apply this in sort of chemical engineering to, to make little chemical machines, the artificial applications, they've made them sort of rigid, but it's permanent. They don't have this sort of nuance that the real cells have. So they kind of have one speed, basically. Lovely TMAO, which stabilizes proteins under stressful conditions. So in our case, it's often pressure, but also in heat and in the presence of other chemicals as well. It's just a generally lovely molecule that keeps things working as they should. And they demonstrated that you can use TMAO basically to affect the rigidity of these microtubules. Without TMAO, they're sort of straight and rigid. As you increase the concentration of TMAO, they bend and buckle a little bit more. And this helps to adjust the speed of these tubules through a gel medium. Really interesting to see another use for this really interesting molecule that comes up a lot in our life. So we were chatting on the sort of bioprospecting episode and a few times about the natural solutions in the deep sea as like an extreme environment that could then have uh, industrial applications. And this is one of them. Lovely TMAO can be used in making little molecular machines. Very good. There we go. Somebody on that last job, do you remember Prima who read out the blobfish? Yes, yeah. She has some deep sea moisturizer. Interesting. Japanese, of course, made with deep sea water, which once you remove from the yeah. sea is not deep anymore, so it's seawater. So like, it's, um, it's been desalinated, desalinated yeah, so, it's so there's water. nothing to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, yeah. It's weird seeing like a bit of, I suppose it's homeopathy essentially creeping into it. It's like, oh no, but it remembers that it was deep sea. It's like, not, not once you've boiled it and just collected the water. <laughs> no, you just turned it into cream, but anyway, yeah. So oh, you can buy a deep sea moisturizer now. I am unsurprised. Well, you need it. Me. <laughs> TerraDepth, which is a startup which is mapping the seafloor, has raised another $20 million on top of their $8 million they raised in 2019. Drone-based AUV 
mapping of the seabed down to six kilometers deep. And the little drones themselves have some edge computing and machine learning in them to help stitch this all together. And this next chapter is them developing their data platform, which is going to be called Absolute Ocean, which they describe as the Google Earth for the ocean. And the little bit that sort of stuck out to me was that this is their way of monetizing the data that they collect. All right, because most other portals are free. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I thought but, the whole point was this big push to make everything open access so that everyone can have access to our planet. This is a private company. Ah. Um, is it the same as Survey? Like, Marine Survey happens, people pay for that, and that's their yeah, data. Yeah, because there are areas of, like, resource extraction, so that data is, has a value in terms of exploring for oil fields or... If you just map a seaman in the middle of nowhere and say, if you want to see it, it's going to be a hundred bucks, and then no one's going to come paying a hundred bucks. Well, I would say it's probably not going to be that scattergun, and it probably is more like Survey. It probably is. We think there's a nodule field or we think there's a seamount that might be exploitable here. Hmm. So I think it might be survey style. We found more nodules on the last trip as well. God, it's oh, all coming back to me Why is now. everyone looking for them? <laughs> They're everywhere. Wasn't. You can't move for them. Nah, south of the Diamantina Fracture Zone is an enormous big manganese nodule field called the Cape Lewin field. And there's papers on it from 1982. And the guy was like sort of speculating it probably goes a bit further east. And you found it further east? Yeah, it totally does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's so bigger than we knew. Yeah. Should ocean data from the open ocean have a paywall should we not all get to see it but at the same time if you don't pay then maybe it doesn't get taken that's, that's just it yeah that's just it i must admit i don't like this hippie thing that goes on at the moment about i shouldn't use the word hippie because that's probably next generation probably, it's probably like out that. of date <laughs> uh, it's probably it's probably a swear word now but i don't like this whole idea that every time you go to a conference now and whatever go to a meeting or a workshop it's all about everything you do should be made open access and you should just give away all your data to everybody i find that really actually quite insulting because if that's the case well why should I bother doing it? Yeah, it's got to be a certain amount of, I am, you know, without being selfish, like I'm doing it for a reason. And when I'm done, it's all yours. Well, if you're under loads of pressure to publish and you have to sort of publish four papers a year of this certain standard yeah. and you're gathering the data to get that. But once it's done, put an embargo on it. Say, well, we've, we've done this. Um, this is ours now because it exists because we went looking for it and funded it and did it. And then we can do what we like with it. But when we're done and when it's on our terms, saying actually... You don't need this anymore. He uses all of the CDT there. For any expert in a different yeah. field who can get something different from this. Yeah, people say, no, no, you've, you've taken CDT data, therefore you must give it to all these things. It's like, well, go and get your own. We had a good chat on that with uh, with Kakani, and, and she was sort of talking about how these portals, because it's digital data and because it's all online, how your ownership can still be embedded in the metadata. And so, yeah, you still you still get to do your work. There's still traceability. You still get the credit for the work that's done and the credit for what other people may then do with that work. And I think that's what we need to to reinforce around there. So it's not, you're not giving it away. You are allowing everyone access to it, but you still maintain ownership of the data that you take. Yeah, it's not the ownership. It's just the fact that there's an entitlement. That's, mm. that's what grates with me. It's the entitlement. It's, oh, you have something, therefore you should share it with a massive scientific community. Is the so fight... I will when I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't like being told that, you know, the day you get off a ship and it's yeah. like, I just want to go home. Yeah, you've not even oh, had no, a chance no, to look at it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it will come. It will happen. Yeah, when you fought, fought for the funding. And you but it's only people really who don't get their own data who call for it. So after after the next five years, I think I'm going to stop going to sea and just go to every workshop and conference and just scream at people and say, oh, you need to give me your data. Because <laughs> then I don't have to bother going to sea anymore. Other bit was an interesting bit in The Guardian about science as a language barrier. Yeah, I don't think it really gets talked about enough because we talk a lot within the community about leveling the playing field and capacity building and things like that. But like, it's still mostly published in English. And I find writing a scientific paper really, really difficult. It takes me ages, as Alan can attest to. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I need shouting at. But like, writing in a second language. I'd find incredibly difficult, like on top of all that, whether we've got a bit of a Tower of Babel within science. So currently I'm trying to work with some old Russian manuscripts. There seems to be a lot of particularly deep sea work behind the, the Iron Curtain, yep. separate from the rest of the scientific community for a long time. And there is some genuine, really good stuff that hasn't reintegrated with the rest of the community. You know, there's there's people talking about things and people sort of describing things that actually... If you look at some of these old greats, there's some really, really good science, and they've, they've already had these ideas, you know, 10, 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's the same when I used to work in Japan quite a lot. There's a whole bunch of stuff published in domestic journals, which are basically published in Japanese. Yeah. They don't see the light of day because outside of Japan, because no one else outside of Japan speaks Japanese. So they are a really good sort of way to tap in, but you need to be on the inside to know someone who can sort of search yeah. it and say, this is the one you're looking for, this will be interesting to you, by the way, this is what it means. But... 
that's just how some countries do it. We're on the cusp of it no longer being a problem. I think there's like good automated translation on the horizon. Kind of excited about how much that's going to open up the world because of miscommunication. So what language should we change it to? Just anything? Should we go back to Latin? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) I think it'll become almost language agnostic if we get far enough with like good automated translation. Uh, I did attempt my own translation script on some of these Russian manuscripts. So I did like text recognition on the scanned pages and then fed that through into Google Translate, accidentally created some long form poetry. It's not useful for me. (laughs) It's not quite there yet. So yeah, it's interesting. There are communities that are isolated by language. And then English is sort of the dominant language within scientific publishing. And I was recently told by an editor to remove a translation into the native tongue of where that specimen was from because the journal only published in English, which seemed a, a shame when it was a fish, you know, from a place that people may be interested in. I'm going to talk about aquariums as a total tangent, just because I've got hold of the mic has nothing to do with deep sea, of course, like that would be crazy if anyone kept a deep sea animal in an aquarium. You can. (laughs) Shush, no spoilers. I'm I'm, I'm leading to it. A little bit of interesting history about keeping aquatic animals, basically. The Sumerians first kept fish in artificial ponds 4,500 years ago. So ages, ages ago. Ancient Egyptians as well quite liked a bit of fish keeping. And a lot of these things sort of started off as keeping food fish alive and fresh. So basically putting live food fish in the fountains, keeping them for when you want to eat them, like lobsters in tanks. But due to human nature, and again, same as the lobsters in tanks, you often see a news story, somebody finds one that's an interesting color or a little bit bigger or sort of unusual in some other way, like these blue lobsters that keep turning up, and they just can't bring themselves to eat it. And so they ended up keeping them basically as pets. And that was the sort of transition into sort of keeping an aquarium and aquatic animals as pets just for the enjoyment of it. Chinese were likely the first to successfully breed fish. And again, that was carp for food. But then Japan later selectively bred those carp and we got goldfish and koi, two species of fish that we synonymize with sort of being pets, basically. So goldfish not natural then? No, no, a type of carp. Oh. They're not even gold. (laughs) <laughs> disappointed they're kind of a coppery brown it's a recessive trait as well if you don't keep them nicely bred they all go brown and like one in ten eggs of gold oh there you go i didn't know goldfish bowls were present in england in the 1700s but nothing more complex because we hadn't yet figured out oxygen and nutrient cycling so i think goldfish were very briefly kept in bowls in the 1700s i don't at think what, they lived very long at what point in civilization did people start putting their crusty feet into tanks and letting the fish gnaw their corns and frucas off that luckily was a recent fad that has disappeared <laughs> is that like a recent 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 like not yeah. 10 15 years i think people used to go to the springs where they live as like a healthy restorative thing but there was like that wasn't particularly good that was a great way of transferring diseases and i think most of the pushback was these were in beauty parlors and these are living things like mm. a lot of those poor what little fish. after five o'clock stays after five o'clock Ex- exactly you know it, you can't use it like a foot spa it's a living animal and you've just fed it on feet covered in oils and ungments for the last sock weeks. fluff yeah yeah and sock fluff and toenail fungus oh. So those poor little fish. I'm glad they vanished. I I've not seen one of those foot Well, they're all probably on while. the street now. They're all... <laughs> I don't think there was that many that survived that <laughs> need rescuing. They're all choked on sock fluff. Oh, it wasn't good. So it was all a bit of fun at first, like more fish and aquatic things as decoration. But it was actually great for biology. It gave us a chance to observe some natural behavior. And it was sort of publicly entertaining as well. So the first display aquarium was open to the public in 1853 in Regent's Park in London. So here in the UK, but spread around the world. Pete Barnum even got in on the act. He had an aquarium as well in New York. The Germans were very into their tropical fish. They were the first to sort of start bringing tropical fish back. And that was sort of in these wooden ships making month long passages. And they were kept in metal tanks with a candle under them to bring the temperature up. Nice. So that was it. Only the very hardy ones made it back. And they didn't realize at the time, but a lot of them tended to be the air breathing ones because the water gets so horrible. But again, we were sort of still figuring out the nitrogen cycle and how not to make fish die. But as things got more and more exotic, we knew less and less about how to keep them alive. When I used to work in the aquarium trade, we'd sometimes get things that people hadn't seen before. You know, it'd just be with a batch of a known species to be something a little bit unusual. And you had to sort of try and figure out how to keep that thing alive, which is what we call husbandry. So a few of the weird ones was um, there was a catfish that we got that nobody recognized. And all it would do all day 
is swim under the outlet of the filter. And we couldn't get it to eat. We couldn't get it to sort of explore the rest of the tank. It would just hang there, basically. And after a little bit of research and figuring out what it was, it turned out it's a type of catfish that lives in the plunge pool of waterfalls. Hmm. And it just waits there for another poor, unfortunate fish to fall over the waterfall and arrive stunned. Didn't really know how to hunt. It didn't really know how to feed unless a fish fell down the waterfall, basically. That's so really specific. It's really specific. And when you're trying to figure out, like, why won't you eat this food right there? But all we had to do was to put them in the outflow so that they acted like fish that had been washed over a waterfall. And it, it ate great. Uh -huh. um, there's also, there was a, a species of, you know, the spoon tooth sucking catfish, the ones that you see like munching on the glass, people get them to clean algae. Yep. There was one of those that was just wasting away. It just wasn't thriving. You give it the algae wafers and things like that, but it couldn't, couldn't digest algae, couldn't digest cellulose. And what it actually fed on was the biofilm was, was not the, the planty part, but the actual microbial mats. Hmm. And so the way to feed that in the end was to spread marmite or vegemite on a piece of slate and bake it in the oven so it got nice and stuck on and if you put that in there it loved it because it's essentially just wow. microbes so really hard things to figure out just for keeping the animals alive it gets reared again when you're trying to breed them because you've just managed to keep them alive and happy and then breeding at least within the freshwater fish it's quite often a counterintuitive sort of traumatic event so there's some that will breed in the flooded forest floors so what you have to do basically is to let the tank get lower and lower and lower, let the water get more and more polluted and more and more devoid of oxygen. And just as you're about to kill your fish, you dump in loads of cold, fresh water and a load of leaves. And that's how you trigger them to breed, which when you're trying to keep these animals alive, it doesn't sound great. Sounds a lot of hard work. I'd rather have a fish that lived off nothing but sausage rolls. <laughs> Sausage rolls and a thorough shouting at. Yeah, you just taunt it with sausage rolls and like num, 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 num. You essentially had that. You had a weather loach that you had for ages. Said, You've got it now. I've got it because we, we immortalized him in his pickles. Yeah, I saved a weather loach when I was at university and I didn't realize at the time it was going to live for another seven, eight years. <laughs> uh, so eventually died and being in the business that I'm in, uh, I just slept it straight into ethanol. And it's, so we it's, still have it. It's in the collection. So we've got loads of deep sea fish and then this little weather loach just smuggled yeah. in around there. Yeah, I dedicated my entire PhD thesis to that eel. You did? I did. <laughs> I went against the grain. So I'm not doing some big fluffy emotional, oh, thanks for everything. You're all so wonderful. I'm like, thanks to the eel. Cheers, eel. Because you're the only one who didn't betray me. <laughs> so yeah. Good stuff. Yep. There's also weird things that like live in desert pools. So there's a, some that you can get to, to lay eggs perfectly. But if you want the eggs to hatch, you've got to gather them all up and stick them in the airing cupboard for a week and totally dry them out, which feels really counterintuitive. But they won't hatch without that. Sounds like really hard work, that's. It's hard work keeping the animals, but you can learn a great deal from it. Deep sea. Yeah. Can we keep deep sea animals? You've still got the same thing like having an elephant in a zoo that instinctively it might just think for reasons i don't understand i want to walk ten thousand miles to the west yeah and it can't you remember the same thing with deep sea animals even if you can overcome the pressure and the temperature and everything else maybe they just want to go they just want to go they'll need to migrate or yeah. something or whatever it might be so it is a bit of a weird one wasn't it like a giant isopod that didn't eat for like 10 years five years yep five years was it? which told so us clearly a lot about how long they wrong. can go yeah, yeah, yeah that's not the experiment the experiment was not how long can a giant isopod go without eating it was <laughs> Why is this thing not eating? Clearly, you don't know something. Like you, all the examples Something's you just missing. gave. The, the weird thing was it seemed, there's some video of it, and it seems like confused by it. It holds the food, and it's like nuzzling it, its mouth parts against it, but it's just not eating. Whether it's a parasite thing or something had gone wrong with it. It just fell out. <laughs> it's really strange. I didn't realize it was, it looked like it was trying to eat, and it just wasn't able to. So yeah, they have been kept alive, the giant isopods, giant Japanese spider crabs. They have been in a few displays now. I think Birmingham Sea Life Center was one of the first places to have them. And in 2001, they got one million pound cover in the event that one of their giant crabs escaped and mauled a guest, basically. What? I think, I think that's absolutely publicity. I, I, yeah. Because they're, they're not capable of holding themselves up when they're out of the water. Like a guest would have to hold it to their face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I think it was publicity, but they did get the policy. Just for the record, I know this is never going to happen, but if it came down to me and a giant spider crab, I've got it. Yeah, I think, you, don't step in. No, he's mine, let me... Yeah, yeah. it's me and him. Back off, everyone. This, is, <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> I could take down a giant spider crab in here. Yeah, in air, easy. Probably they more can't as hold well. Up. Some sort of aqua lung. They're not quick. The same with like the really huge spiders as well. Like The giant arthropods are scary in theory, 
But when you actually meet any of these things, they're like, oh, I'm too big. This yeah. doesn't work. This body plan doesn't work. Yeah. They're like barely coping. Yeah. Some of the coconut crabs, like they're wild, but they're slow. Have you tried to take one out? Oh, I don't know. They're a bit pinchy. They're a bit frightening looking. Someone may have cracked keeping at least some deep sea species in the aquarium and have learned a great deal in doing it and gone through a lot of the things I've highlighted here where you just have to figure out how to artificially recreate what these animals need. And in doing that, you learn a lot about them as well. You know, you realize what is the triggers to reproduction, what is important to them, and it revealed a great deal. So lucky enough to chat with aquarists from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, who have recently launched their Into the Deep exhibition, including many species of deep sea animals that have never been held in captivity before and on public display. So the general public can experience a bit of the deep sea firsthand. I'm lucky enough to be joined by some of the team from the Monterey Bay Aquarium to talk about their recently opened exhibit, Into the Deep. Uh, there is something very special and unique about this exhibit, but rather than spoil it sort of myself, Brian, could you just give us a, an overview of the exhibit and what makes it special? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so yeah, Into the Deep, it's a brand new exhibit that we just opened to the public this past Saturday. And yeah, it's all about the deep sea. Um, so we're showing animals from the from the deep sea, uh, describing it as a, a threatened and a rarely seen environment. And we're, we're trying to give a window into that world. Um, we're leveraging our relationship with our research partner, Mbari, for this exhibit. So we're working with Bari on all of our collections of all the live animals. Not all, but, but many of the collections and, uh, and to show folks about the, the tech and the research that goes on in the deep sea. That's the exciting part there. You have live exhibits. You are displaying deep sea animals alive. And one of the big sort of cruxes of the show is, is the misrepresentation of the deep sea and its wildlife. And you cannot misrepresent something when there it is alive in front of you. Really loving that this is giving the general public access to the deep sea, which has been quite an exclusive space. It's now for everybody because it, it is everybody's. So we've got a bit of a team actually on the call now because this is a monumental task and it took a lot of skills coming together in order to do it. Could you just all introduce yourselves, basically, and, and overview your technical speciality within this exhibit. I'm Ellen Umeda. I'm one of the aquarists here on the Midwater team for this new Into the Deep show. Um, so we are responsible for the exhibit animals that are below the surface, but not on the bottom of the ocean. And I'm Michelle Kaiser. I'm an aquarist on the Benthic team. Um, so my team looks after everything that's on the bottom of the ocean, and I personally take care of the deep sea corals. And uh, my name is Brian Maurer. I'm the manager of life support systems here at the aquarium. So life support systems is all the equipment that moves the water around, that conditions it and keeps it nice and healthy for the animals. On this exhibit, my team and I uh, designed the life support systems and now we're operating and maintaining them. Really exciting stuff. So let's let's get to the real celebrities here. What is the lineup? What animals are you, uh, are you bringing to the public? Many are for the first time and there are some that even are new to science. For the midwater, we have a lot of animals that we're displaying that have been displayed at other aquariums, but we also have some really cool new animals that we've collected with Mbari that haven't been displayed. Things like the bloody belly comb jelly, the nanomia, the common siphonophore, even some new discoveries like Red X, this little cytipid that's red and actually hasn't even been described or named yet. So. Hence the sort of cool X-Man name. Yeah, so um, <laughs> yeah, just a variety of animals. And then also some animals like Pelagia flaviola's tiny little nettle that other aquariums have displayed before. But um, it's really cool to see those as well. And then on the benthic side, we have a bunch of really cool iconic sort of species like the Japanese spider crabs or the deep sea lumpfish. And then in terms of really neat local stuff we've collected, we have some really interesting snailfish that we've never really worked with before, both Japanese and local. We have some eel pouts, which are really creepy and weird, um, that we only recently had success with. Um, we have the bubblegum corals, which I don't think have been displayed in any aquarium. That took us a long time to figure out how to keep those alive and feeding. And we have some basket stars and bone worms, which are pretty incredible, and giant isopods. 
Brilliant stuff. That's a good celebrity list from Deep Sea Critters. This has been a massive undertaking and you sort of allude to the difficulties in maintaining some of these animals because there, there isn't a guidebook. No one has done this before, <laughs> or, or at least not with some of these species. Sometimes it's even like how you collect them is part of the learning curve of how to take care of them. How did you even get these back alive to start the then difficult task of keeping them alive? Well, I can speak for both Ellen on the Midwater team and our benthic team is that we use the same robot or ROV and it either has a sort of suction which Ellen can go into for the, the jellies but for the benthic stuff we use the manipulator arm which is basically just a giant robot aluminum clasp that you point at something and the pilots pick it up with it and that's basically it. There's different ways to pick it up. Sometimes we'll use a spatula. We'll have them hold a spatula on the manipulator arm and pick up things like pancakes, like if it's a sea star, or we have like a colander scoop and it's like something you'd see at McDonald's where they like pick up french fries with it. You've cobbled something together actually on the cruise. I do love seeing that super space age manipulator arm with like a cooking implement at the end of it. Right? It's like <laughs> it's like a total But it does mix. the job. Yeah, it's like super <laughs> um, complicated and then zip tying bachelor from target on the end we once made a brush to tickle things to make them bioluminesce and so it's this big impressive arm and then this like little homemade brush at the end for poking a oh, coral totally there's sometimes <laughs> we even will take like a kitchen sponge that we'll steal from the galley on the ship and zip tie or like rubber band it onto the end of the manipulator arm if we're going to pick up something like pretty delicate and we don't want the <laughs> the like uh the grabbers to like mar the surface of it and so the pilots are always like oh yeah the galley guys get mad because we steal all their sponges for our state-of-the-art equipment right. <laughs> once you've sort of got those critters in the bio box how are you sort of recovering them and maintaining them on vessels on my end I, i'd say that's the most stressful part that's the big environment change that's what's gonna right. kill something quick i guess well first of all i i would start at like pretty much throwing away everything you would assume you would know about this animal and just you know if it's a coral just don't even think about any tropical corals you've ever taken care of, just just throw it away. And then in terms of getting it in the bio box and getting it up, one of the things that I always think of is like, this animal has never seen the light of day. Like, how would you feel if someone picked you up <laughs> in a pitch black environment and thrust you to the surface and then opened the drawer and there's sunlight? And, you know, to these animals, they've never adapted or evolved to take in that amount of sunlight it's an alien abduction it They're is an alien abduction sucked into space <laughs> so i always you know in in like alien movies i imagine when people are abducted they like wake up in in the spaceship and it's like super duper bright white light and they're like can't even see that's what i imagine it's like to be a coral in a bio box we've been trying to shield the light on top of the bio box with like stuff you would use to make like a box to de develop film in Oh, um, we tinkered with some old film developing stuff. We were trying to preserve eyes, basically. Yeah. And of course, we didn't want to bleach the pigments. So we used a lot of film canister stuff because there was all these clever things that would close, but the opening wouldn't allow light in and things like that. So yeah, we were messing around with some weird tech there. Totally. Yeah. It, yeah. You basically just have to think super outside of the box. So on my end, yeah, we experimented a lot with shielding light from collection drawer to ice chest that you put these animals in and that seemed to help a lot with a lot of the R&D so that was a, that was a good first step that's interesting so you found light as the biggest hurdle that they really were damaged by it or, or stressed at least I think stress would be a better word it could be that we got better at the husbandry on the other end of things when they got here but it seemed to be a better jumping off point they weren't already stressed they weren't burned i would say already yeah because they're never going to experience uv light their dna is probably quite vulnerable to to getting blasted with sunlight right exactly <laughs> So that was a good first step for the Benthic team. Were you maintaining any sort of pressure or was it more about giving a cold environment because the, the two sort of play together? The only thing we thought about was the cold and that changed for if we were or are collecting anything with a swim bladder. So something that maintains its buoyancy. And the way we sort of mitigate that is by doing a mini little safety stop like you would do on a scuba dive and just sort of stop halfway between our bottom depth and our ROV recovery and just kind of hang out for a little bit. Maybe that could be 20 minutes. That seemed to help a little bit. And it's amazing that it's the diver answer. It's the deco stop yeah. that seems to have made a real difference. Totally. One of the cool things we sort of anecdotally figured out about the benthic animals is kind of going into it. We all thought these animals need really 
long periods of hard sheets of laminar flow just sort of drifting over them. And we learned pretty quickly that is not the case. In fact, it was quite the opposite for a lot of the really delicate animals, um, which now that I say that they're delicate, sounds pretty straightforward. Don't blast them with flow. But, you know, when you see them on the bottom of the ocean, they're basically poisoned away. It looks like they've been sprayed with a garden hose yeah. in one direction. But they look like a tree that's grown exactly. on, a, on a sort of windy bank. It's sort of, I can tell which way the wind blows by which way you're leaning. Exactly. And then we get them in the tank, we turn up the flow and they just they don't really do so hot. So it was kind of the opposite, especially with like the Bersingid stars or like the corals. Like once we dialed everything down to opposite of what they get in the wild under pressure, they did great. I don't know the physics behind it. I don't know anything other than it was just opposite. And so I can't help but wonder if the pressure sort of mitigates that. It wasn't an exaggeration when you said like the first thing you had to do was throw out everything you knew. <laughs> these were sort of counterintuitive right. to what you knew of these animals. This is incredible. Right. Cool. And it's really hard to do that. <laughs> you, <laughs> it, like, it's, it is because we've spent a long time learning all that stuff yeah. and it's hard to hear it's wrong. <laughs> I mean, the plight of the Aquarius is like, I know what you need. I don't know how to give it to you. <laughs> I'm just going to keep Oh, there's some parenting analogies there. It's like, I know what would make you happy. Why are you fighting me? Right. And then it's also like, well, I tried this once, but it didn't work, but I I better just try it again. And then you end up just definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting something different. And then it's like, wait a minute. No, do it opposite. (laughs) I can say for the corals, the flow was huge. Like we had so many corals that just never came out. They, their polyps never came out and they wouldn't eat and they would not thrive. And it was like, okay, throw more flow at them. And it's hard for when you're comparing it to tropical corals because they eat light. It's the same if you take, you're taking care of like a gorgonian. Basically, they have to physically eat food too. But paired with the fact that they can't photosynthesize and just don't know how to get them to eat is like... And there's such a time lag. An upset coral stays upset for quite some time. So even when you get everything right, you don't get that confirmation and feedback for a while because they sulk. Right. They sulk for a long time. And I'm sure like a deep sea coral compared to a tropical coral, the the feedback time is even slower. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Any other tricky ones? So for the midwater animals, it's um, a little similar to what Michelle was talking about. We do use the remotely operated vehicles with the ROVs that Ambari has. We use the suction sampler, kind of turn up that flow and then suck that animal slowly down this tube and into a set of collection containers um, in the bottom of the ROV. So that's one way that we get animals. And that tends to be for animals that are a little bit more hardy and won't just fall apart at the touch of anything. Collecting jellies to me has always felt like, remember that buzzer game where you've got to move the ring around the metal maze without touching the side? Collecting jellies is like, you need to get them, but they can't touch anything on the way. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And actually, that's we have another method too on the ROV that's even better for not touching the animals. We call them detritus samplers. I guess clear cylinders, and they've got sort of a lid on the top and a lid on the bottom and and, um, they're both open and the ROV pilots at Ambari are amazing. I don't know how they do it. It's kind of like a video game, I think, for them. But they essentially just take this massive ROV and the container in the front and then just like prop it right over the animal or the jelly that we want. And then when it's right in the center of this tube, they just quickly shut the doors and they don't even touch the animal. So that animal is just like intact. Those containers are great too because when it goes to the surface, because they're so well sealed, they maintain the oxygen levels. It'd probably be lower. And then also the water condition. ROV pilots are very talented and that they're able to do that. It's amazing, isn't it? Because you get all focused on the instrument and you're sort of super zoomed in, but they're essentially moving like a transit van behind that camera yeah. <laughs> with a time delay in three-dimensional space while maintaining awareness of everything else going uh-huh. on. Because I just, I'm too myopic. I'd, too, I'd zoom right in, but they're incredibly skilled. It's amazing to watch. Yeah. It's amazing. Because a lot of our animals are vertical migrators, during the day they're living at deeper depths, but at night they come to the surface and they're in the shallower depths just because there's 
less predators and more food available. We actually have been able to do some night boating just in Monterey Bay. So at night, we'll just take one of the boats near the Monterey Canyon. Usually we get Nanomia bejuga, which is known as the common siphonophore, but a lot of times they come to the surface at night. We see them a lot on the ROV dives, but you can also get them at the surface. We'll go out there and see them, just scoop them up and bring them back. And they're pre-adapted to that migration. So you, you can bring them up and you know they survive at surface waters, even though they are only visitors. Yes, yes, definitely. They're well adapted to changing conditions. So <laughs> it really helps us in a lot of ways. A third method that we've been collecting, um, just probably within the last couple of years, actually, our team will go out to Hawaii and do some blackwater diving. I'm obsessed with blackwater diving. So cool. <laughs> I've only done it like once on my own and it was so cool, but I was like a complete nerd about it. And I was like, oh my God, look at that species. I didn't realize you could swim with them. Like I can swim with an abyssal fish. Like fair enough, it's as a juvenile. There was a whole episode where I just lost my mind because I didn't know that it was a thing. And then I just discovered it. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> um, but that's been another uh, method for collections too for us is blackwater diving. A lot of these animals are vertical migrators, so they're coming to the surface at night and you can just scuba dive and collect these animals. Obviously, we don't have those like fancy detritus samples on the ROV, but we've got collection containers. They're just little plastic jars, but you know, if you got the technique, it's just the technique. You got to get your technique. You just have to. <laughs> it is that buzzer game. We move jellies all the time for even just our regular jellyfish exhibit here. But it's just like you got to get this technique and then you just know like when you open it, it just has this suction and it just sort of gently pulls the jelly in there. So you do that blackwater diving and that's how we collect a lot of those animals. Once you got them back to the aquarium, did you have to maintain that migration? Do they try and do it in the aquarium? We don't really maintain that migration. We just pick something. So if we're like, oh, they're at the surface, well, we won't change the water quality parameters too much. We'll just kind of leave it just because it's also easier on our part. If you have a common siphonophore that can live in a lower oxygen zone, we can put them at that. But if they can just be in the regular surface oxygen level, then it's kind of silly to have to change those yeah. conditions and make extra work for yourself. It's like a shared office. Like if there's a temperature everyone can agree on, then why why show off the fact you can live with hardly any oxygen? Yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> why put that extra effort into it? <laughs> <laughs> have you noticed any changes in behavior with the lights as you get visitors? You know, when the lights come on in the aquarium, are you noticing like they try and head towards the top? Lighting has definitely been a concern for us. And if you walk around the exhibit, you'll notice there are a lot of no camera flashes, no, you yeah. know, but... I think, you know, a lot of these animals that we've been able to display, they can handle some light, specifically for midwater animals a lot of time, is that sudden change in light. And the common siphonophores, they, whenever you just like flash a light on them, you can see they respond, they just dash away. And that's a concern because sometimes they start to lose their little nectophores or they start to just kind of crumble. and Bits drop off yeah. when they get stressed, don't they? <laughs> Bits drop off. <laughs> and, you know, obviously yes. we're trying to keep these animals 100% in Attack. So when bits start dropping up, you're like, oh gosh, no. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like it's promo shot anymore. No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, but they, they can regrow it. And we have seen yeah. some regrowth in some of our animals, but we just try to avoid that in general. Just don't flash them with light. You guys are mentioning changing the parameters and adjusting things like that. I think it's it's Brian that that falls to, isn't it? You're behind the scenes making these things happen. Yeah, definitely. What are some of the hurdles that you had to overcome technologically? The main thing was the low oxygen systems. And that's where most of our work has been over the years, figuring out a way to maintain those very, very low oxygen levels that some of the animals require, not all of them, but some of them, and doing that in like a, a recirculated system that we can feed and that we can maintain. And We've been working on that for five or six years. We had a little R&D system up in our wet lab, playing around with different technologies and then landed on these gas transfer membranes to remove oxygen from the seawater. You know, we've had low oxygen systems in the past year at the aquarium. We had a deep sea show about 20 years ago. But at that time, we were bubbling in nitrogen and using nitrogen to displace the oxygen in the seawater and pretty much push it out of solution and out the top of these reaction chambers. But what that left behind was a bunch of little nitrogen bubbles. And many of the animals can be really damaged by those. 
So this time around, decided early on that we can't uh, accept these micro bubbles. We've got to figure out a different way to do it. So we played around with these gas transfer membranes. And essentially, these are contact chambers with a bunch of little straws. The straws are permeable to gas, but not to water. And so we'll pump seawater through the membranes. And then on the gas side of the membrane, we'll run a nitrogen gas and apply a vacuum. So we create this oxygen deficient, very low pressure environment. And that just makes the oxygen and seawater want to cross that membrane and come out of solution without any gas replacing it. Is carbon dioxide coming out as well? Any pH that you have to then correct for? No, you bet. CO2 does come out of solution as well. To uh, compensate for that, we do add CO2 back in through a, a venturi, basically running seawater through a, an, an injector and injecting CO2. But we're doing that for two reasons. These animals also come from a low pH environment. So yeah, so we're, we're driving the pH down to 7.5, 7.4, essentially whatever the animal needs to correct for that CO2 that's removed in the gas transfer membranes and just because that's what they need to begin with. That's really cool. Five, six year project. And you were starting from a prototype as well, weren't you? So this has been a real sort of R&D project in itself. You bet. Yeah, we started just with a really small, you know, like, 15, 20 gallon system in our wet lab, no animals, you know, getting all the pressures and the flows dialed in and then built a, a couple of low oxygen holding systems. So scaled up significantly to like a thousand gallons and then actually started working with animals in there. And then it was a big give and take back and forth with Michelle and Ellen and on all the aquarists on, you know, exactly what conditions the animals are doing well in. So we ran those holding systems for several years, built a, a holding system to take on the ship. So out on the cruises so they can put the animals in this low pH, low oxygen environment, and also very cold right after collection. And then, yeah, we scaled it all up significantly and, and built the exhibit. Amazing. I do love getting behind the scenes in an aquarium. Everyone loves a protein skimmer, but when it's two <laughs> stories high, that's impressive. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it can be fun to see. Yeah. I'd say one curveball on that transport system, the mobile system, we designed these systems up to work in a nice, stable, shore-based environment, you know, where everything's, you know, not sloshing around. <laughs> and then uh, the first yeah. time we took the mobile system out there, you know, the sloshing just made it barely work at all. So that was a, a big learning curve. We needed to make all those columns of water much taller to keep the oxygen from getting back in the water. And now the stakes are pretty high. We've got to keep these animals alive. So we've got tons of redundancy and alarming and doing rounds many, many times per day, so Something falls out of range, we get a message to our phones and to the, you know, control software instantaneously and can run down there and hopefully fix it. You know, another thing that I think is just super cool is how flexible these systems are. Typically, you know, we'll have a show and we'll design, okay, here's the conditions that we need, we need to meet and we'll build a system to meet that. In this case, early on, it was decided that we don't know what we're going to collect and these systems have to be able to essentially hit that entire gradient from surface level down to 3% with respect to oxygen saturation and pH from 8 all the way down to 7.4 and anywhere in between. And then temperature as well, 75 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to 40 or maybe just a touch colder than that Fahrenheit. So they're not super bespoke for the animals you have now. There's loads of future scope. Exactly. And so, you know, it still baffles me, you know, how simple it is to adjust the systems. We've got these touch screens and you just enter, you know, on the touch screen where you want pH, where you want oxygen, where you want temperature. And then all these valves automatically adjust their cycling rates and everything like that and, uh, and bring the system up to those conditions within a couple of hours. We're more than happy to share with other aquariums and we're happy to talk to them about everything that we've done. That's one thing that's pretty cool about the aquarium industry, I think, is very collaborative. Oh, that's really lovely to hear. Now we have access to these animals. They've been acclimatized. They've got used to their new conditions. They are hopefully showing natural behavior. And so this is a massive opportunity scientifically. We only get glimpses of the deep sea. We visit there. And when we visit in a huge hulking vehicle, we're shining artificial lights. It's not a, not a natural situation. So having access to these animals, hopefully in their natural and relaxed state, have there been any interesting discoveries? Some of our benthic animals have been gravid lately. We have some sea pens that are about to spawn, and we also have some gravid snailfish, which are going to lay eggs any wow. day. Alicia Batondo, our other uh, co-worker aquarist, has raised snailfish from eggs. We're all really excited for the local ones to lay eggs because then we will have a lot of them. They're really, really cute, pink little snailfish. And I'd be fascinated to know about the courtship and how involved both the adults are, if there was any parental care. There's a massive variety in the snailfish reproductive strategy, like right up to parasitism. Do you know what this particular species tends to do? Yeah. So this is the uh, in the genus Care Practice and 
These have been known to lay their eggs on the bottom of crab carapaces. We've also had live crabs have snailfish eggs on them. Actually, a week or two ago, someone in the shallower, nearer shore side of the aquarium found snailfish babies hatch out in their tank, in their crab tank. And we were thinking they might have been the deep sea ones accidentally, but we've even found crab carapaces at the deep with snailfish eggs on them. So I think the goal is for them to give them a carapace and have them lay eggs in it. That's really exciting. I'm particularly fascinated by fish reproductive behavior in the deep sea and it's all inferred currently it's all looking at body structures and sort of where the animals are found and where they're found when they're gravid and ripe totally your ability to like see a courtship maybe ah that's that's super super exciting to me yeah you know for these we didn't even see any courtship we just kind of one morning showed up and one was three times bigger than it normally is so (laughs) that i mean that in itself was really cool (laughs) I feel like they're the fish to love if you don't love fish. I just, like, I'm not a fish person, but I love, yeah. I love a snailfish. How can you There's a lot that? of personality to them. I think the, the close runner up is the lump suckers. Right. I think you can't be mad at a juvenile lump sucker. Totally. <laughs> I'm glad they've won you over. Even if you're not a fish person, I'm glad that they were sort of. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they're pink too. How can you not like that? <laughs> Another cool thing is, I don't think anyone knows how the, the Cyboga Gorgia and the Parrot Gorgia, I'm sure they spawn. No one's ever written about them or anything, but a lot of the times when we collect them on rocks, we'll find little tiny babies next to them. And so that's kind of another thing we've been looking forward to seeing if if they kind of shift or, bud or, or break if something bud or break yeah. off or if there's going to be a spawning event. Like nobody knows. We have a really healthy population now, so I'm sure at one point we'll see something. There's questions we've been asking for so long, and this is going to give us a little window into it. This is going to be really interesting. What about the pelagic stuff, Ellen? The bloody belly comb jelly, which is, you know, that jelly that you know, looks like comb jelly, but it's bright red. You know, when the light kind of shines on it, it's little teen rose. It looks like it sparkles. I don't think that would have been possible at all without this low oxygen system. Figuring out the parameters for that, that's just been, it's been challenging, but... Now that we have them kind of figured out, it's just been really cool to be able to display those animals. And I think another favorite of mine is the paper lantern jelly, Pandea rubra. You know, we see small ones, we see big ones, you know, bigger ones kind of the size of a tennis ball, softball. Those are really cool too, but we wouldn't be able to display those without low oxygen either. And then Michelle kind of touched on culturing and spawning. Our team's been able to spawn some of the animals that come to the surface, live in sort of ambient seawater conditions, like the common siphonophore that I was talking about earlier. Um, we've been able to spawn some of those and get little tiny babies. Pelagia flaviola, the mauve stinger, which were collected on blackwater dives in Hawaii. We're actually on the, let's see, F2 generation right now. So when you actually go to the exhibit, you won't actually see the ones that we collected in Hawaii. You'll actually see their offspring. Being able to culture a lot of these animals kind of relieves this need to collect. You, if you can just raise them in-house, that's even better. And, and you get to learn about their life cycles. And rule out any sort of collection stress to that generation. Like that generation is fully acclimatized and has, has lived within your system. There hasn't been that that sort of collection event. So that that's brilliant. You're on the second generation already. Yeah. It's kind of like you're artificially selecting for the animals that live best yeah. in the aquarium. <laughs> I think our next challenge is taking these animals that are in low oxygen systems and spawning those and raising those up. We've only just figured out how to just keep the adults alive and healthy on exhibit, but I think our next step would be to try to get culture started of those. So that's kind of the next step. In my Aquarius days, it was always a two-step process. Like there is what you need to keep the animals alive, but then breeding requires this whole like extra level of contentment and sometimes even like weird triggers you know a sudden ph change or a sudden cycle change 
and that will trigger reproduction. And there's so much trial and error to sort of figure that out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, even with just sort of our local jellyfish, like the moon jellyfish and the brown sea nettles and all that, we have to oftentimes just do temperature changes. Feeding was an issue as well, wasn't there? You had to develop some new methods to actually deliver food and get these things to eat. Since we're working with pelagic animals, they're eating a lot of pelagic foods. When we go collecting, we're not scooping for deep sea copepods and plankton. So we actually culture a lot of copepods in house like acarsia and parvo colonists which are just you know these are commonly cultured in the aquarium industry we've been culturing those and then feeding those out to a lot of our animals because some of these are medusivores meaning they eat other jellies we have to culture other jellies to feed them so that could be moon jellies or bolinopsis which is a comb jelly tinafores like um, hormifera so we're culturing those to to feed our animals. So we're culturing more jellies to feed our jellies. And then we also get mycids and some really tiny larval fish. And those will actually target feed. So as these animals are coming to the surface in their tanks, we'll just take like a tiny pipe pet and just paste oh. a little fish between their lobes <laughs> and then they close it up and they eat it. So that's a very tedious task. I'll say that. That's what it is for the midwater animals. I know it's different for the benthic animals, and I'm sure Michelle can speak on that. If I'm not schlepping out to do a plankton tow to get some plankton to feed to the corals, we're, we're just doing a lot of broadcasting of either fresh or frozen copepods or rotifers um, for the filter feeders. But there is some stuff like the Brisingid stars. We have a species that's undescribed and actually only does well in Brian's low O2 system, and that exhibit is pretty much sealed. There's a lid with a boat hatch that has a seal around it, so it's not exposed to the surface. And so feeding that all day and making sure it has food is kind of funny. We ended up taking a little thermos, basically, and drilling a hole in it and putting an air stone in it to keep the food circulated, which is a bunch of different frozen copepods and algaes. Um, and then hooking that up to a dosing pump that is sealed into the lid of the tank. And so that has basically allowed us to keep the O2 low and the food constantly present, which is the only way we've gotten them to survive. So that's kind of the one weird way we feed our animals in the benthic side. Yeah, you can't just pop open the lid. Uh, no. <laughs> put some fish flakes in. Right. You're like, I just need to do this. Do not touch them. Do not open the lid. How about cleaning? Is that an issue as well? We're lucky we don't have to do the water changes because... We have flow through, thanks to Brian. I mean, we do have to do a ton of maintenance. You have to really limit how much you put in. The instinct is always to overfeed, and it's often the, the worst thing to do with an aquarium. You can't, right? Yeah, it's a balancing yeah. act for sure. We've got kind of a cool, um, basically a whole other standalone system. We call it the fast fill tank. They do do more like 100% water changes, but they have to have the system open for opening and they got to do all this stuff in the morning. So we've got a, a whole other tank that we just put online, you know, the night before one of these bleaching and cleaning events and then a dedicated piping system and pump that runs out overhead to all of these. We can bring down a big body of water, low oxygen, low pH, very cold, and then just have that kind of on tap and, uh, and ready for a fast fill and make the opening deadline. Yeah, of course, because this is difficult anyway, but you're open to the public. You, <laughs> it's showtime. You've got to get all this done ready for sure. opening. The main way that we do maintain our tanks is to bleach them, essentially. So we take out all of the animals, put them in a holding tank that's low oxygen, and then we'll essentially just pour bleach on the tank, fill it up with some fresh water, neutralize it with sodium thiosulfate, and then we drain it out and then fill it back up with the system that Brian was talking about. And that for us is kind of the most efficient way to clean everything. A hard reset. Yeah, a hard reset. <laughs> yeah. And you just do that. Well, however often you do it. I'm so jealous. <laughs> that's, that's yes, that can't the, be an option. Yeah, yeah. That's a benefit of the midwater stuff because there's not much in it on the bottom. Actually, there's nothing in it. You don't like sides anyway. You don't care yeah. where you are. <laughs> the gas transfer membranes that I was talking about earlier, they're super prone to fouling. And so one consequence of that is we actually filter all these systems down extremely fine, down to like one micron and, and even sub micron in some cases. So I think one consequence of that is, yeah, you know, the algae that's in the system is, is largely going to be filtered out there. It's a very sterile yeah. system. Not only have you overcome all the stuff, this is now sharing the deep sea with the public. We spoke on the last episode about live streaming dives and how 
the deep sea is becoming accessible to the general public and how we want them to care about it because maybe more than any other habitat it's kind of our shared heritage so when did the exhibit open and have you found it have you seen people responding to these things the exhibit opened to the public two days ago yeah april 9th april 9th so it's your first weekend yeah it's our first weekend it's been super busy it's spring break here so it's packed you know i've been staring at my exhibits for for months we had the really cool opportunity to basically function as if we're open, but not let visitors in and sort of test out the exhibits. But it's been really rewarding walking around and watching people look at them and but watching people's reactions to these animals they've never even heard of or thought existed is pretty fabulous. I can imagine like you in the build up sort of, I can't wait to show you to people. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. All this, all this work, all we've achieved. It's like, I can't wait for them to see you. Pretty much. You know, we've been working on this exhibit for years and years, and it is only within, you know, the last year or so that they took out the previous exhibit and knocked all the walls down, built the new walls up, got all the life support in. And oh my gosh, it's, it's happened here and now we you know everyone gets to enjoy it and come visit and see what we've been working on are you guys getting to do sort of a victory lap are you getting to give talks and bask in the celebrity the compliments <laughs> help i love being complimented <laughs> i won't say no to them it doesn't hurt does it <laughs> <laughs> They're welcome. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I gave a talk at a conference recently and, and, and you know, the media has been coming through and yeah, it's been fun, you know, been working on this for so long and, and now we get to share it. And we get to do things like podcasts, which are really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll all be discovered. <laughs> Guys, it's so easy and no one stops you. I, <laughs> the only thing you've got to lose is your career and your credibility. And, and it's been going two years now. And every episode, I think like, nope, this will be it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'll include some links in the show notes so anyone listening can scroll down and there'll be links to the social media to follow. Also, the the world is opening up a little bit and maybe you're planning your trip to the States. And maybe you're picking which cities to go to and maybe this has like swayed you. I am certainly going to jump at any opportunity that I have to visit this exhibit. I'm very excited by what's gone on here. And thank you so much for granting me a little bit of time. Uh, I feel like I know so much more about it now, and I'm I'm only more excited because of it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank you. It's been fun. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. I do have a funny story about that. Yeah. All the names will be left out, but I was asked to review this paper once by someone who was using an ROV to capture deep sea animals in the hyperbaric chamber and bring them back to the surface and then doing lots of interesting sort of observational things and a few whatever experiments we're trying to do in it. It was one of those ones that was, well, yeah, you can bring them back under pressure, but then what do you do with it? You've got a bomb. Well, it's trying to keep it alive because you've got to feed it through this thing. You're trying to keep, you're not trying to decompress it. You're trying to keep it at pressure. So you have all sorts of problems with oxygen, food, and everything else. And the fact that it's now in a tube and it's freaking out because it's in a tube. Anyway, the thing that got me was reading between the lines that there was a sentence in there that said instantaneous decompression resulted in abrupt mortality. Agreed. <laughs> As if that was some sort of result, like it was part of the experiment. So if you take this animal and put it to 200 bar and then just put it to just zero, open the tap. just open the tap, and then suddenly this thing basically exploded. That's, I think somebody turned the wrong valve and they made it into a result. Reading between the lines, I don't yeah. think that was part of the experiment, right. but they felt it necessary to... to just so it. you know, if it's like saying, well, you know, I was looking at this uh, spider monkey the other day and I hit it square in the face with a shovel. It didn't <laughs> like it. In fact, it seemed stunned. It's just one of those results that it's just like, I wouldn't pretend that that's... It didn't thrive. Yeah, I think someone's accidentally unplugged that and it's just went, no. Yeah. Oh, you've just, everything's just exploded. I think that's the wrong valve. I think the wrong valve's been opened. Hello, no one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. Hello, my name is Ely Iglesias, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I think I may have stumbled upon the best possible way to listen to the Deep Sea podcast. But first, a bit of background. Everyone knows that pursuing a PhD on deep sea biology can be stressful, which is why I've tried to sneak out into the water to catch a couple waves here and there surfing whenever I get the chance. However, a couple months back, I managed to whack myself pretty hard in the head while surfing. You know, they tell you hobbies are healthy, but in this case, it proved to be not quite so. And this resulted in a bad concussion and lingering effects I've been having to limit my screen time. Given that my research requires me to stare at a computer screen all day long, looking at fisheries acoustics data, I prioritize this practice and have had to forego some of my nighttime diversions, such as television or reading for that matter. Thus enters the Deep Sea Podcast. For the past couple months, once my baby was down, 
and all screens were turned off and I was still suffering from splitting headaches. I would retreat into a cold, dark room and tune into tales of science in the deep sea. In many ways, emulating the conditions of the deep, dark environment in which the podcast was being described, it kind of helped bring the stories to life. And now that I'm slowly recovering, I don't have to listen to podcasts exclusively in the depths of a dark room, but I just might continue the practice because it was so enjoyable. So thank you so much for getting me through a tough time and thank you for your time. Bye. I did have a listener question if you wanted to. Ah, right, go for it. Yeah. Yep. So it's actually Meryl who we've been both been speaking to oh, yeah. a yep. little bit. She wanted to know how you mitigate against vessel entanglement or ghost nets or other marine debris when you're in a submersible and how much of a risk there is to this. And I think we touched upon it on the episode, but that was significant at one point. That's a good point. Yeah, you try to avoid that at all costs. It's mostly done by driving very, very slowly and being very vigilant in terms of watching where you're going. No fast manoeuvres. Most subs don't move fast. It's not like you're going to get snared. The issues we've had is the challenge of deep and all these discarded fibre optic cables that people have been jetting in there. That is a real problem because they're very, very thin. If it was a troll net, for example, you'd see you'd that. See it coming. You'd see that and you'd get well clear. You wouldn't even go and have a look because it's just polypropylene rope and these plasticky type of ropes. If when they go through thrusters, they tend to get chewed up and jam. They melt, don't they? If they yeah, they, too much. they melt. They're really horrible. They don't like get cut. If you like, they don't. They just get harder and harder and get gummed in it harder and harder. So you don't want you don't want to get anywhere near that stuff. But yeah, so the fiber optics are a real problem. The risk of something going wrong is sort of far higher for itself because, of course, it's human occupied. But it's ROVs are the tricky ones because it's a multi stage. You know, you've got to manage that umbilical cable as well. So you are your own tangle risk essentially yeah. you're, you're flying the vehicle but the pilots have to constantly have a sort of mental awareness of where their umbilical is going you can't just yeah. explore you are trailing this thing behind we had you. this on, a, on an rv once it was in a, it was like a nazarene canyon or stubble canyon or, or lisbon canyon i forget which one but the rv had gone down done its job and was coming back up and it suddenly stopped midwater and they're like what on earth and looked at the umbilical and the umbilical was going down not up and what it was was an uncharted submarine cable like a telecommunications cable going across the top of the canyon Ooh. Like a like a rope bridge, and now we had gone down one side, done its transect down, and come back up the other. So then it, it's now hanging midwater, and the pilots are like, "If we go forward, are we going to tie a knot in this?" It's very delicately trying to back out the reverse the way they came in and go back down, and it was awkward. To this day, I don't think I ever saw the cable. You just know that you couldn't go up because something was pulling on the bottom of the cable. And to do the like forensics on that to figure out that's what's going on here. Yeah, that's good I mean, stuff. in terms of like ghost netting and stuff like that, I think you don't tend to get that real deep sea because no one really trolls out there as much as they do certainly in coastal regions. The waste tends to be sort of quite broken down by the time it finds its yeah. way. Big lights flood the whole area. Yeah. I'm mesmerised by the foam on the walls. <laughs> While Alan is mesmerised by the foam on the walls, that has been this episode of the Deep Sea Podcast. No, but seriously, the way they've cut it, like it goes up one way and then it's 90 degrees the other way and then the way they fit it around the light switches is I can't work out whether or not I'm kind of in awe and say, well, well done, lads, or that's a really bad job. I'm not sure. The 90 degree rotation is obviously a thing because you break up or sound let, waves. Let's be more diplomatic. Mm. It's nice, but it's not how I would have done it. Oh, okay. How would you have gone around that light switch? This is great audio, by the way. I, I'd imagine it is, yeah. Uh, I would have made it a wee flap. A wee flap? <laughs> a wee flap, yeah. I think it would have been better because you never know what kind of sound waves are bouncing off of that light switch and interfering with our audio. Maybe that's <laughs> the, that's responsible for the hum. It's just that light switch. Yeah. I guarantee people wouldn't find the flap there. Ah, oh, but I'd label it. You still label, You'd label it on a sound stage, aren't you? How do you make a soundproof label? I know, but just because you're in a sound stage, I'm just saying you can't have words. <laughs> like written you can, words. You can hear the words. It says you can hear people door, thinking when they read them. Keep shut, right? It's okay to have that, but not the light switch is under this flap. Under this flap, behold my flap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love it though. It's good. It's nice. It's nice cool. and quiet. Our merch is still available. If you would like to show your support for the show, feel free to adorn yourself with a uh, deep sea podcast t-shirt is there anything else to plug alan what's coming up uh deep sea aprons well yeah you've got your apron you're very happy about that should we do like our first deep sea recipe or something should we let folks cook along at home yeah sure yeah let's film that that'll be that'll be tv gold that'll be great yeah well you can make little yeah. little chocolatey nodules and you could make onion bargies for xeno firefalls I was just thinking of Victoria Sponge and just writing Deep Sea on it. <laughs> Do that too. And really lovely italic handwriting. And a birthday that isn't yours. Yeah, yeah. just make myself a birthday cake and then remind myself what date it really is by inscribing it on said cake. So as ever, we'll deep see you next time and we abyss you already. Do you want to say that? You're in the room. No. Nah.
on no, that. I'll never get you recorded saying that because yeah. you only have to say it once and then I can use it every time. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by a company, Amartus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea for yourself, we can support you with logistics, cruise planning, and actually getting you out there. If you would like to bring the deep sea to your audience, we can help with science communication, with podcasts, with presentations, fact-checking for what you're already doing. Do whatever you like. Just do whatever you like, yeah. <laughs> for money, we'll just turn up. Yeah, how about that, yeah. <laughs> if I, I'll, I'll turn up wearing at least an apron. <laughs> You have to pay extra for more than the apron, but yeah. he will wear his yeah. Deep Sea Podcast apron. Deep Sea Podcast apron and a big smile. <laughs> That's a good point, though. We should tell at some point on the podcast what the company actually does. But then we can't because we're still under NDA. Yeah. So we can allude to it. It sounds like a lie. <laughs> it does sound like a lie. Yeah. Um, in fact, most of what we've done either hasn't come to fruition because various networks haven't ruled with whatever it is we're working on and various books haven't been written or films haven't been made. There's like a two to four year time lag in this space. Yeah. We've done a lot, we just can't talk about it. And Ooh. you're still going to see, you've done loads. <sighs> yeah, well. Just I mean, opened a massive centre dedicated to the deep sea. Yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't come easy. <laughs> Does it was that more than an afternoon's work? Yeah. 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 It doesn't come fill out easy. Some forms. It's not necessarily the easiest thing to do either. So it is what it is. <laughs> you, you can't recommend it. What's the politics involved in doing anything anymore? It's, it's just relentless. Anything huge. Well, it's when you've got a lot of money. Suddenly lots of people come out of the woodwork and expect you to just fund loads of stuff. And it's like, no, it took me this long to get money so I have enough money to do what I normally do. I'm not just yeah. going to give it all away. And say, it's like, oh, you just got a big grant. Oh, can I have $500,000? <laughs> no, because <laughs> I've just earned myself $600,000. I'm only giving it to you. It's weird. There are vultures in this business. It's staggering just how much it really costs, especially once you've got a vessel involved. Like the fuel, that's like 30 people. You're employing 30 people. You're but the, bu the bulk of the budgets are huge. If you look at, you know, we've got two ships now at our disposal and a submarine and all this kind of stuff. And you're looking at staff for five years. Multiple staff, in this case about 12, maybe. But the, once you put all the overheads and pensions and, and running costs and consumable costs and all that other stuff, I mean, it sounds the amount of money, I'm like, oh my, wow, that's like millions and millions and millions of dollars. But actually, when you work it out per year, and yeah. how much is, there's no profit on that. And what it actually costs. There's no profit on that. That's the weird thing about academic life, is these grants sound huge. And I guess they are. But nobody's got any spare change. A six-week big expedition on like one of the big research ships, that's in the millions. That's how much it costs to go see. That's why when you take samples or someone gives you samples, you can bloody well publish it. <laughs> movie the planet of the apes when they like throw two people in the cage and they're like have babies and it's like that's not really how it works <laughs> that's, very much that's so. how i think it, it is being a deep sea aquarius